So what do we find when you combine Robertson, Robertson, and Bowlby? Well, the answer may not surprise you if you've heard of what I'm going to talk about. And if you haven't, it may still not be surprising, but hopefully informative. Welcome back, everyone, to The Broken Brain. This is Thursday This History, where every week you get a little insight into the history of psychology, culture, and just other stuff that I might usually talk about on the show. This is a very special once-a-month episode where everybody gets to hear the whole episode. See, in the regular uh, audio feed, you get a little teaser every week. Uh, and then if you're a patron, you get to hear the whole Thursday episode every week. Well, this is the once-a-month where I make a Thursday history with history for everyone on Earth who dials up, dials up the, the RSS feed. And today we're talking about a documentary from 1952 called A Two-Year-Old Goes to Hospital that was made by uh, James and Joyce Robertson and influenced and collaborated with as well with uh, John Bowlby. All three of these individuals were instrumental in the development and application of attachment theory, which you've heard talked about a lot on the program with the various guests who talk about the way in which we attach to people in our lives and the way in which we're able to attach to the world around us, to safely attach, detach, have safe boundaries, to feel like we can be ourselves, all of those different things. Very, very fundamentally important. And if you go back in time a while, and I suggest that you do, but make sure to bring a change of clothes and money that's, you know, appropriate for the era if you're going to. Like Doc Brown, have that briefcase full of money on Back to the Future 2. Not the strongest of the trilogy, but man, I thought a lot about that briefcase of money when I was a kid. All this money separated by dates. Wow. Where was he going in, the, in between the movies? Am I right? But anyway, go back far enough and you'll find that uh, in a lot of cultures, children were just considered to be little small people. They were physically smaller and weaker than an adult, but that was basically it, uh, when there wasn't a real appreciation of psychological development. And so when you do look at, that certainly, it doesn't seem like it was true everywhere, but but in many cultures that was the prevailing opinion. And the way that uh, we've developed things that have to do with, like, say, child labor laws, and also things that have to do with the exposure uh, to intoxicants or adult materials, even just the concept of adult materials or people under a certain age being legally protected from the behavior of adults. That is, unfortunately, some people still don't seem like they like that very much, but most of us are on board with the fact that there is something much different and much more important developmentally about some of those years when we are children. I think, I think most of us are on board. I'm going to go ahead and assume you are. And the film A Child Goes to Hospital is actually uh, plugged into that instrumental thought process and those changes. So who are these people that I'm talking about? Well, well, let's start with John Bowlby first. He was a British psychologist. He was uh, trained in psychoanalysis and then got to into developing. He's really known as one of the, if not the, developer of attachment theory. Uh, although there's a lot of collaboration back in these days. He's the one whose name kind of got tagged onto it the most, let's say. I always assume that there's a bunch of people who probably didn't get their due when, when these things are developed. But Bowlby's really the big name that you're going to see with attachment theory. Uh, Bowlby believed that humans are born with just an innate need to form close emotional bonds with particularly their parents or caregivers or guardians or whoever it is that is in their life. But generally speaking, we would think of that as the parents. We could do episode after episode about how this theory is applied. In fact, as I said before, I've interviewed a lot of people who uh, look at different ways to apply attachment theory into the way that we relate to ourselves, to our partners, to the world around us. Uh, but some of uh, Bowlby's approach, he, he had a theory of four unique stages of development that people go through, um, starting out with undiscriminating social responsiveness, which is really thought to be in the first several months of, of life, around three months or so even. And during this time, uh, there really isn't any real discrimination. Children do tend to attach to anyone around them. 
Um, they may primarily turn to their mother for feeding or, you know, to those that they're familiar. But they have a pretty undiscriminating social responsiveness, which is why it's called undiscriminating social responsiveness. This eventually turns into more discriminating social responsiveness, which is kind of the fundamental uh, groundwork, you could say, of just having social boundaries, right? And this continues on, you know, during during the first years of development of life, they get into a active proximity seeking behavior is and then uh, goal corrected partnership it would be the the goal so basically what we're looking at here is you got no real social boundaries you start to develop some social boundaries you get into where you're actually looking for proximities rules and expectations of, of the way people are supposed to react around each other and then uh, goal corrected partnership is the last one, and uh, we could go more into that. Uh, but I will tell you, we'll go into more on probably a different day, or you can look back on some of the attachment theory episodes. Um, if you go, if you go to study.com, look up Bowlby's infant attachment theory by Dr. Melissa Hurst. There's a great, and no relation, by the way. Uh, there's a great slideshow, actually, that, that goes through a lot of these different stages and things. But we will push on. But let's just say that Bowlby has uh, helped to develop a lot of the attitudes and beliefs that uh, that we apply when we start to say, oh, children need things. And development of children is very different and very important from the development that we do for the majority of our lives once we reach adulthood. And introducing uh, James Robertson, it's interesting that there's actually a quote from Bowlby. And uh, I'll be honest with the the quote that I found actually just comes from the Wikipedia. You'd be surprised, maybe not, how many of these start with Wikipedia and, and go out to lots of other links. But the quote itself comes from the Wikipedia uh, article on James Robertson, uh, where John Bowlby said he was a remarkable person who achieved great things. His sensitive observations and brilliant observations made history and the courage with which he disseminated, often in the face of ignorant and prejudiced criticism, what were then very unpopular findings, was legendary. He will always be remembered as the man who revolutionized children's hospitals, though he accomplished much else. Besides, I am personally deeply grateful for all that he did. Um, James Robertson was a, a Scottish social worker and psychoanalyst. Um, he worked uh, primarily, he did a lot of his work through the Tavistock a clinic, which is still in in operation through a, a National Health Service Foundation a trust that, that actually keeps that going. It was developed as an organization that uh, was, was founded in psychoanalysis and would do uh, work with uh, the British Army, with the prison system, probation services, and just basically other, other populations that need uh, to be seen. And not, nowadays that has uh, moved very... Uh, into more modern approaches with talk therapy and still having some of those roots in psychoanalysis. But the development of attachment theory uh, was greatly helped by the work of James Robertson and his wife, Joyce Robertson, who worked together to provide better health care for children and to apply some of those attitudes and, and theories about psychology and psychoanalysis uh, to looking at children in those developmental stages. So uh, Joyce was a British social worker and also a researcher into child behavior. Uh, also, both the uh, interesting thing about both of the, the Robertsons were both uh, pacifists, were conscientious objectors, and focused their energies more on health care, uh, even through World War II era, on taking care of. And obviously, the foundation of the Tavistock had a lot to do with, with it looks like, with providing services for soldiers and things like that. So they looked like they were trying to help the war effort in that way of providing health care and research into uh, effects on children and things like that that were there. So they actually met each other in 1939 while he was studying at Furcroft College and she was studying at Hillcroft College. <laughs> that old rivalry. I don't know anything about either of those colleges, but I did find a uh, during the war, uh, with their status of conscientious objectors, they did uh, work at a pacifist service unit in East London, and they helped out victims of bombing. So they were very actively involved in the war in, in, in that way. Joyce actually had worked with Anna Freud, Sigmund Freud's daughter, um, looking after the, the psychological care of infants and, and looking at the way that uh, women in shelter programs, uh, many people who had lost parents and loved ones and partners 
uh, through bombings and through the war, obviously. So there was a lot to be studied. You know, they didn't use the phrase trauma informed care back then, but, uh, I, you know, some of those early psychological theories and psychiatric care were really sort of paving the way to consider that, you know, events that we go through. And, and this was going to be a long time before the word trauma was going to be applied to non combatants, basically. Um, we kind of moved with an understanding of trauma from people who were actively combatants in in a military zone or in a war, you know, and then that sort of broadened out to people who had uh, had near death experiences, and that took a while before that started being appreciated. Eventually, trauma started to be applied towards abuse, and now you know we have a better understanding that trauma as a as a sort of umbrella term is not just one thing. There's all sorts of different scales of this, uh, basically. That, that we're on with people use the phrase little t trauma, big T trauma, basically that uh, abuse, that loss, grief, and occasionally, you know, that there's a lot of subjectivity, even something that can have like a major life disruption uh, can be traumatic, especially if it interacts with something else. And the things that we do because of trauma and because of interrupted attachment patterns where we have a hard time attaching people, some of those choices we make when we're not healthy can also traumatize us. So that all kind of feeds in itself. But so when you look back at these things, sometimes they don't use the terminology and they didn't have the understanding that we hopefully do now and have developed, uh, but they were still doing stuff that led us to where we are now. And I think that's always important. That's one of the reasons I bring you these little history histories. Well, and so when you've got uh, John and James, John Bowlby and James Robertson, who had a lot of study and and obviously, you know, not to downsell anything about their experience, but um, they had a lot that they would study and theorized about attachment. They obviously cared a good deal about children, but Joyce was really the one who brought some personal uh, insight into it, which is not surprising because she, as a mother herself, uh, she was able to give uh, that insight. And so one of the things that really ultimately led to this, uh, the movie, by the way, was released in 1952. And we'll get more into the details of that, of the movie itself. But um, before the documentary was even conceived of, uh, their children were conceived of. There we go. That tied in well. Anyway, but in 1944, um, they had James and Joyce had their first child, a daughter. And then uh, she had to take her child into the hospital for treatment. And this was when she learned and realized that she was not able to visit her daughter when her daughter was in the hospital at some times during childhood. Um, that basically that was normal. You dropped your kid off at the hospital. You pick them up when they're done. OK, hopefully better even than, you know, with whatever they were supposed to be working on, but similar to how maybe you drop your car off at a mechanic shop. <laughs> and some hospitals that even did allow visits only allowed 30 minutes per week. Hospital stays were also much longer back then, whereas now, you know, many things are considered outpatient that would have had you there for a few days, those kinds of things. And many hospitals, and I have not found a justification for this or anything. I just had read in one little article here that some of the hospitals had a rule, no mothers. So you think if you had visiting, that's who you'd probably want to have there, but they didn't. So Joyce Robertson also started uh, some of the first uh, actual parent-toddler groups that had education for parents and was actually sought out by Sigmund Freud uh, when it came to issues with children and working with his daughter, of course, as well as Anna, they started working together again in the later 1950s. And so did a lot of that care and and concern about the psychological treatment development of children uh, from a very personal standpoint. And of course, worked closely with James around this as well. And that's where James started to put together the idea of this documentary. And so you had these big three, these big uh, three powerhouses in the area of belief and investment of the development of children, uh, John Bowlby and James and Joyce Robertson actually put together uh, this this documentary. And what they did was they identified a young child. Uh, her name was Laura, she's two years old, and came into the hospital for a hernia operation, which right away, this is sad. Poor little kid. Um, so she goes in for eight days. At this time, 
Uh, this is, I think, one of the things Bowlby was talking about in that quote about people pushing back on these ideas. So one of the things that uh, that James was having a really hard time in his work, that he did a lot of public-facing presentations and education and pushing back with uh, with doctors and others and parents, trying to convince them that this meant a lot more to the children than they thought it did, that it could have more of an impact to be away from their primary caregivers so that was where the idea came in to get a camera involved and to track this this child's experience. They start out by uh, filming this young girl being brought into the hospital and left with a nurse. And it, right away, you can see, obviously, a very emotional parting. One of the things that, that the mother is encouraged by the nurse is that, oh, she will settle down when you go. Now, here's the thing. She obviously was quite upset. And there were tears, and they were able to capture all this on film. As they watched over the, the eight-day stay uh, for, for this young child, uh, and, and by the way, let's say here, here's the norms, you know, that you can see in the film, that there are cribs, basically. So there's a two-year-old just kind of sitting in a crib, has a teddy bear, has a blanket. Nurses come around. They lower. It's one of these, you know, where the, the bars section of the crib lowers down. They check on the kids. They'll give them, you know, some toys. Or they give them food. They give them a little attention here and there. But basically, you're spending a lot of time doing what you do in the hospital as you, you sit there, right? And so here they are not only not having their primary caregivers, but not having a lot of stimulation, okay? In fact, I would go so far as to say, I do, I'm not an expert in evolving hospital policy, but from what I see on these little video clips, you know, the, these children have less stimulation than an adult. An adult would demand a TV or a newspaper <laughs> or something. But but as far as I can tell, you know they they don't really have much of anything going on. So, uh, but so they ran into this very interesting challenge uh, that uh, James and 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 uh, Bowlby were concerned because they weren't finding that Laura cried very much, that she just didn't seem to be very teary enough. And it was Joyce who, as they were you know, looking through footage and as they were discussing whether or not this was even going to prove the point they wanted, that she started to point out little nonverbal behaviors and the things that Laura was doing to avoid crying or to self-soothe, the effort, the tremendous amount of effort that she was putting in. And then when she did talk to the nurse... Uh, for example, she heard another child cry, asked the nurse, very just monotone, very, why is that boy crying, and then burst into tears herself. So there were these little moments they were able to find to where they could showcase, yes, the child's not crying all the time, but that's not the measure. And see, this is another thing where this is a milestone. This is a pioneering thing to be able to say, if my child's not crying right now, right, does that mean they're fine? And I think you know, nowadays, all of us, hopefully, have a little more psychological literacy to look inside ourselves and say, am I fine, air quotes, just because I'm not crying right now, right? But you still see these problems do crop up occasionally uh, when we look at our own children and we say, well, I think they're fine. They haven't said anything. Uh, have I really hunted for what's really going on? Have I really asked them? Have I been paying attention to the things they're doing in order to be fine? OK, I'll throw out just something I have witnessed in my own experience working with families and working with young people uh, for, for years and years is that sometimes when there is a mental health crisis and let's say a young person becomes self-harming, they attempt suicide or they, they cut themselves or hurt themselves in one way or another, um, that is sometimes that's what comes out. Or maybe it doesn't quite get to that point, but they tell someone that they are thinking of that. They talk about depression or anxiety or out-of-control mood uh, things or a compulsive disorder, OCD type of symptoms. Once they finally start to talk about it, everybody gets worried. And one of the things you want to try not to say, and if you've said it, you know, try to not say it again, <laughs> which is to say, I just want my kid to get the help they need so they go back to being that happy little kid that they were before. Now, it's not a terrible thought process, but when we say that, it doesn't communicate the way what we're really trying to communicate, I think. When we say something like that, what people hear, if I'm the one who was suffering and then maybe 
even kind of hiding my suffering. And you say that to me, I hear, oh, you want me to go back to when you didn't know about my problem and it didn't bother you, right? I think what people really mean when they say that is I want you to be happy and I want the best for you. But we don't think it through this way. We go, oh, you know, boy, a year ago you were fine. And it's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> no a year ago I was worse than I am now. Now I'm being open and we're getting some treatment and we're working on it, right? And since we're working on it, it's maybe more upsetting to talk about. Um, but it's much healthier and the person is much healthier and safer than they were. And so I just think we just need to keep those things in mind when we're talking about uh, our health, our children's health, things like that. And so the the, the sentiment... I think that we have behind that statement is not what is being communicated. So we have to watch out very careful because children particularly, and all of us at some level, we learn over time that what we're supposed to do is just kind of shut up, stay in line, don't do anything that's going to draw too much attention to ourselves or whatever, and definitely don't make anybody else feel uncomfortable. Definitely not if it's about our own needs, right? I mean, that is one of the predominant problems that we have when it comes to seeking after help. So going back to this, this, this really brilliant approach, and I'm very grateful to these three individuals who, and, and the many others that were, that they were building their work on and working with, but the people who said, we need to change people's attitudes about something that is important for child welfare. And, you know, what's good for kids is good for all of us because all of us were kids. And you know what? The kids that are now are going to be in charge eventually too someday. So the film itself is a 30 minute black and white. It, it's it's basically a silent film from the standpoint of you're, you're not hearing anything from the things that are being filmed. It is, but there is a voiceover narrating the, the thing, the stuff that's happening as it goes on. Um, and, and by the way, I took a little break here to uh, look up some the dates and times and things because I don't always have those stuck in my memory. And I accidentally found something that I alluded to earlier, by the way, and I didn't feel like going back. So I'm going to tell you now. I did find the justification for some of these policies. Um, it was not surprisingly, I guess, it was thought that too many visitors was a disruption and would make the flow of the hospital performing its duties to be a little bit impaired. But the the, the real reason I'm I'm letting you know that I found this is some doctors at the time felt that children after a day or two would actually forget their parents and so therefore would not have any distress at their absence. So they just weren't worried about them uh, and their feelings at all. So this, when you have people who are that entrenched into a position, and I would say probably there's some emotional impact of telling people that for an entire career to then say, oh, for 20, 30 years, I've been telling people their kids are fine and they're not that's probably a little hard to accept. And that's one of the things that is difficult about making changes in beliefs and practices. And so this was something that had, you know, the, the Robertsons were, and the Bowlby were fighting with the medical industry about this for decades before the movie came out. The movie then premiered in 1952, and it made a tremendous impact, specifically uh, with, well, obviously with parents, but then also more and more the medical industry started to change. And policies about visiting and even with parents, you know, the norm shifting to not only parents being allowed to visit their kid in the hospital, but under a certain age that it's pretty normal for them to be there pretty much the whole time, right? We take that for granted nowadays, but it's always important to remember that the things we take for granted as healthy and normal and things we should do oftentimes were once thought of as controversial, crazy way too progressive. They didn't have the word woke back then, but I'm sure there'd be people that'd be like, this, a two-year-old goes to hospital movie is so woke. Joyce Robertson would go on to write a mother's observations on the tonsillectomy of her four-year-old daughter. A couple of years later, uh, Bowlby and James Robertson combined, a, wrote up uh, a paper related to the film's release as well. And it just kind of went out from there, uh, continuing their work with children and also helping us to get attuned to the idea that the way we treat kids has a lasting impact on their lives and so therefore on society as well. In fact, from 1963 to 1975, Joyce and James uh, at the Tavistock Clinic, I mentioned uh, before, did a, a long-term research project for, uh, called the Young Children in Brief Separation was the, the project. And they examined uh, 
healthy children during a 10-day separation from their mothers. Would the children respond with the classic protest, despair, or detachment behavior that was predicted by Robertson and Bowlby? And uh, basically what they would do. That was a quote there I'm reading from uh, thetimes.com, an article just titled Joyce Robertson. Uh, so you can look you know, that up. That's a good resource as well. And what they observed was uh, – the interesting thing was they observed uh, much of this detachment and the effects that they would have anticipated. And at the same time, they were able to uh, provide interactions and things. And uh, Joyce apparently – this became kind of the de facto mother presence uh, for the kids – as well as James was mainly running cameras and you know checking in, interviewing the kids. They they both worked very closely together to use video as something that would help to to not only do the research, but to uh, get that research out there in a way that people would see. So James Robertson passed away in 1988, and then uh, Joyce actually survived another almost 30 years and passed away in the year uh, 2013 at age 94. So this this didn't this stuff doesn't happen that long ago. I think it's very important to remember that. So I hope that this is an inspirational thing to you to look at and see how people are making a difference when they're trying to get messages across. Uh, and and not only by banging the drum that was the good drum to bang and talk about but also doing research and doing work and finding creative ways to help people see something that was happening, that was very powerful, that that could be demonstrated. So that is our deep dive into a two-year-old goes to hospital. If you want to learn more about it, there's lots out there. Uh, I would also direct you to go to the International Journal of Psychoanalysis for the, the articles written way back when. Um, about a two-year-old goes to hospital scientific film by James Robertson and uh, Anna Freud uh, contributed to that article as well. Uh, you can find, I think I mentioned a lot of clips on, on YouTube and Daily Motion. I think it's worth seeing some of the examples of how this film uh, works. And actually, a lot of good information I found actually came from Joyce Robertson's uh, obituary. Uh, I got that at theguardian.com. But it was just uh, through Google searches I was doing about her life and, and their lives. And there's just a lot of information about her and James and their work together that I found in there as well. So there's some things you can research. It is September. And so therefore, I should mention that the uh, charity that I'm highlighting this month is Horses of Hope. You can go to horsesofhopepr.org to learn more about this uh, cool nonprofit organization in Isabella, Puerto Rico, where they are doing uh, equine therapy and work with horses to help people with trauma, those struggling with uh, disabilities of one form or another. This is a very, very useful, uh, powerful intervention. Anybody who knows anything about equine therapy or anybody who's into horses, I mean, you know what bond there can be with horses and, and humans, but... There's just a lot of really, really good things. It's something, to be honest, I first became familiar with when I saw um, private residential treatment centers uh, would do this at such a high cost that most people would not really ever be aware of it, to be honest with you, and that it is a cost prohibitive thing for 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 many people to even think about having some form of, of equine therapy. It just doesn't even cross our radar. And so this is an organization that uh, seeks to provide low to no cost for individuals who otherwise may not have these opportunities, and they're doing a lot of good. So go to horsesofhopepr.org to learn more about them. Um, if you do choose to become a patron of The Broken Brain and become a paid uh, contributor to help the show, then um, it's important to know that 50% of your donation will always go to one of our highlighted charities. Uh, generally, unless you tell me different, it will go to the the charity that we are highlighting uh, in the month when we do. You can always check, by the way, to see what ch what charities we have highlighted in the past. If you go to dwighthurst.com slash podcast, there's a link there that will show all the charities that we have supported and are going, you know, going to continue. But uh, that will continue. Uh, your donation will continue to that organization as long as you remain a patron. And so you get access to bonus materials. You get to help the broken brain uh, do more. It's because of your support that I'm able to do more frequent recordings and, and and some of those things that we're able to provide for you. So you can do both or simply go to the go to Horses of Hope and just help them directly as well. They could use all of the donation, too. So 
Thank you for being here. We'll be back at y'all again soon. Have a great week.